to go. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for coming along um, this afternoon. Um, uh, thank you, Johnny, and to the Christians uh, here in Kenaway for, for the welcome. It's really nice uh, to be with you. And I don't know everybody here. I know a few people here, but I don't know everyone. Uh, no matter who you are, many times you've been along here um, to the gospel service in, in Kenaway at the, the Arnott Gospel Hall. You're, you're really welcome. We're really glad um, to see you. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, to be here today. Now, I just want to read uh, a couple of verses with you from the Bible. Uh, first of all, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Please, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, we'll just read the last verse in the chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And reading at verse 13, Paul writes, and he says, So now faith, hope, and love abide, but these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, some of you will have a version um, that will maybe say faith, hope, and charity, and um, I'll maybe just say a little bit more about that uh, in a second. But remember these words, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love love. Let's go back a few books this time to the gospel of John. John's gospel and um, half of the people at least in the room already thought of the verse that I am going to read from. Yes, it is John chapter three and yes, it is verse 16. Uh, my subject for this afternoon is the subject of love. You don't really speak on love without reading John three sixteen. 16. Um, it's a marvelous, marvelous verse. Let's read it together. John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, you'll maybe hear some wonderful things in the English language, you will not hear anything better than those 25 words uh, that I have just read to you now that, about the love, the love of God towards the world. Now, as I've said today for the next half hour or so, I would like to speak to you about the subject of love. Love is something that is absolutely central to the Christian message. This gospel um, message that you're listening to today, and maybe you've listened to it in, in the past as well, love is right at the center, right at the heart of the message. If it's about anything, if you had to sum the gospel message up in one word, I would probably use the word love. The, 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 the message of the Bible, the message of the gospel is about love. The Bible actually tells us that God is love. God is defined by love and love is defined by, by him. And so maybe before we go any further, and I, I know how maybe this is going in the minds of some of you, I used to sit in, in meetings like this and, you know, very quickly switch off. So if you're going to switch off, just listen to the, the, the thing I'm going to say for the next 30 seconds. I would rather you didn't switch off at all. But, but if you forget everything else I say, remember this. There is a God in heaven who loves you. He cares about you intimately and deeply. And I don't, I don't know very many people here today. And maybe you feel nobody really loves me. Nobody really cares about me. No one is all that overly interested in me. Let me tell you today that you could not be more wrong. There is a God in heaven and he loves you. Now, he doesn't love everything that you do. He doesn't love all of your actions, but he, but he does love you. And that's what we want to think about uh, this afternoon, that God, that God loves us. And we want to think about this word love because love is a word that gets kicked around all, all the time. And I think people have in their head this sort of sentimental, slushy, emotional kind of idea. It's the kind of, you know, boy, boy meets girl and they live happily ever after kind of thing. That's, that's not really love. That's, that's Disney love. We're going to talk today about something that is much richer, much, much fuller and much uh, more significant. And so I want to think about five different things in relation to love, five things that love 
is. And the first thing is, is this, that love is honest. Love tells the truth. Even when you do not want to hear it, love will tell you the things that you need to hear. And you probably all have people like this in your life. There are people and they will confront you with things that are uncomfortable, things that you don't like hearing, things that you wish that they never bothered opening their mouth and saying, but because that person loves you, they are willing to say things that you maybe don't want to hear. And they maybe know that you don't want to hear it, but because they love you, they will tell you the truth. Anyway, so for example, if you're coming along to this gospel meeting, and maybe you've listened to, to the message of the Bible before, you will have heard preachers saying things like this. You are a sinner. You are guilty before God. If you don't repent of your sin and trust in the Lord Jesus, you will be lost forever. That's hard to hear. It's not particularly easy, by the way, just for me to, to stand up here and, and say that. And it's not easy for you to hear. But, but the thing about love is this, that love tells the truth. And so if these things are true, and we're going to say, see that these things are true, then if I, if I love you, then I will tell you the truth. You imagine, you imagine a, uh, someone hasn't been feeling too well. Um, and they have suffered with their, their health has suffered over the past little while. So they go to the doctor and over a period of time, the doctor uh, examines them, does some tests, and eventually discovers that there's something seriously wrong with this person. And they, they come in before the doctor and the doctor sits them down and says, look, I just want to put your mind at ease. Don't worry. Don't panic. There, there's not a thing wrong. Just come, continue to live your life the way that you're living it. Everything is going to be just fine. Is that doctor loving? Is, is he caring? Is he kind? Is he merciful? No, he is not. Now, he might have to say something that the patient doesn't want to hear. He might have to reveal a diagnosis that is not pleasant to hear. But if he's, if he's loving, if he's caring, if he's good, he will tell the person the truth. And maybe you're sitting, sitting this afternoon and you're thinking, well, that's all very well, but I don't have a, a terminal illness. I don't have anything particularly wrong with my health. And let you're standing up there and you're telling me that I'm a sinner, that I have done wrong in the sight of God, that I don't deserve to be in heaven. What gives you the right to judge me? How can I stand up here and judge you? Well, I can't. I have no right to judge you whatsoever. I'm a sinful person just like you. I am no different from, from you. And the Christians that meet here in the Gospel Hall in Kennaway, they are just exactly the same as you are. We are all the same. The Bible actually tells us that there's no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I'm not standing up here and judging you. I'm standing up here and telling you actually lovingly, caringly, that God God has already judged you. The Bible tells us that the person that believes on the Son has everlasting life, and the person who believes not the Son and who receives not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on that person. So God isn't going to wait until the end of your life and sort of weigh up your good deeds and your bad deeds and see which one comes out on, to on top. No, God has already judged you. He has already judged me. He has already weighed us in the balances and found us guilty. And he says we are condemned in his presence. And so as I stand up here, I am, I am not, I'm not judging you. I'm, I'm warning you. There's a very big difference between those two things. I'm not judging you. I'm warning you. And I'm warning you because I love you enough to tell you the truth, to be told that you're far from God, that you're not right the way that you are, is not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing to hear. But, but hearing this message might make a difference for you. So I'll give you another, another example. If I woke up uh, this evening and I realized that the flat that I was in uh, was on fire, the first thing that I would do would be to wake my wife up. Now, she wouldn't particularly like that. She wouldn't find that a, a pleasant experience. She's not here today, so I can kind of get away with saying this. She doesn't particularly like to be wakened even when there is no fire in the flat. But if I was to wake her up in the middle of the night and say, look, honey, the, fa the flat is on fire, she wouldn't enjoy that. That's not a pleasant experience. But, but the warning that I would give her just might save her life. 
And so maybe you're thinking some of these things that you're saying, Joel, are hard to hear. And I get that. I understand that this kicks against everything that, that lives in, 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 the, in the human heart. But the warning that we give you in the gospel just might be enough if you listen to it to save your soul. The second thing that we should think about is uh, in relation to love is not only is love is love um, is love honest, not only does love tell the truth, but love is just love punishes wrongdoing. And this kind of builds on what we've been thinking about already. The Bible is very clear that the person who, who doesn't trust in God, the person who doesn't repent of, of their sin, there is no hope for them in eternity. They, they will be lost. They will be in that place that the Bible calls calls hell. And so the question comes, well, well, why? Why is that? And the answer is because love is just. Love punishes what is wrong. I had a conversation uh, about a month or so ago with a lady uh, at a flat in, in Gorgie where, where our gospel hall is. And we were talking about what happens to a person whenever they die. And I said to her, well, can you tell me what would happen to you? God forbid that this should happen. But but if you should die in the next 24 hours, where would you be? And she said, well, I, I think I would be in heaven. And I said, well, how would you be so sure that you'd be in heaven? Well, she said, well, I don't, I don't really think there's anything else. I don't believe that there is, uh, I don't believe in, you're talking about hell, but I don't believe that there is a hell. Everyone just goes, goes to heaven. Everyone just goes to the good place. And I said, okay, well then wh what about, what about Hitler? What about Adolf Hitler? Where is he? Is he in heaven? And immediately you could just see that sort of the thoughts going through, almost see the thoughts going through her mind. She's well, 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 no, no, I don't think I would believe that, that, uh, that Hitler is in, in heaven. And the reason for that is this, that we recognize that evil deserves judgment. It is a good thing to punish evil. It is not a good thing to, to overlook evil. So if we apply that to ourselves, that's why we have a, a judicial system in the country so that people don't do wicked things to, to one another. If that applies to us, how much more then does that apply to God? What kind of God would look at sin, look, look at evil, look at the suffering that we cause in this world and just look on all of these things and just shrug his shoulders and say, well, well, I don't care. It doesn't mean anything to me. If God was to look on the evil actions of people like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, and this list goes, goes on and on. If he was to look at all of these wicked actions and, and just say, well, I'm not going to do anything about that. Would that God be worthy of our worship and, and our praise? Is that a God to be honored and to be admired? No, of course not, because because wicked things, evil things deserve judgment. It's actually because God is loving that he punishes sinners. There's no contradiction between the love of God and the wrath of God. In fact, I would go further and submit to you that the wrath of God springs from the love of God. It's because God is loving that he shows wrath. True love hates what is wrong. True love demands justice. It demands fairness. Uh, it demands fair treatment for for people. And, and that maybe sounds fine. I'm kind of talking about this in, in a theoretical sense, and we're condemning people like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, and so we should. They're, these are, are, are wicked men, but let's let the rubber make the road for a second. What about you and me? What about the, the way that we have lived our lives, the evil things that we have done? And you're immediately thinking, and I know because I'm thinking the same thing, well, I'm not as evil as these people. I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the things that they have done. No, perhaps not. But you have done the things that that you have done. And I think it's very easy just to demonstrate that that we all are sinners. It's not, even if you re reject the authority um of, of the Bible, if you've ever, if you've ever felt at any stage in your life guilty for something, if you've ever thought, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that, that was wrong, I, I, I wish I could take that back. We've all had moments like that. We probably have moments like that nearly every single day of our lives. Do you know what that proves? That proves that we can't even keep our own standards. I can't even keep my standards, never mind keeping God's standards. So if I can't keep my standards, I definitely can't keep his standards. And that brings me under the judgment of God. That puts me in a place where this God, who's a God of love, who will always act to protect what is good, he must judge me. I deserve punishment and we are all the same all have sinned and come short of the glory of God but you know if 
if that was all we had to say about love, it would be quite hollow. It would be quite, it would be quite empty. It wouldn't leave us with very much hope uh, for, for this, this life. Uh, but I want to come now, we've thought of two things that you might in some senses think are, are negative in relation to love. I want to think now about three very positive things in relation to love. And, and the first thing is this, that love is long suffering. Love sacrifices. Love is willing uh, to, to give up something. If a, person, if a person loves you, they will help you no matter how much it costs them. Now, you'll no, have noticed, so, or some of you will have noticed the verse that I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The version that I read says, Now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Some older versions, older translations of the Bible will, will, will replace the word love with charity. And while the word really does technically mean love, charity is not a bad word to use because what is, what is charity? Charity means that you give something without expecting to receive anything in return. And that is the kind of love that God has shown to us. There's nothing we can bring to God. There's nothing that we can, that we can present to him to make ourselves worthy in his presence. There's absolutely nothing we can do to make ourselves right with him. But God loves us anyway, in a charitable way, in a way that gives without expecting to receive anything in return. Maybe another example <coughs> might help us here to understand something of, uh, of, of the love of God. Um, this story is about a, a, a young man called Billy McFadgen. Billy McFadgen grew up in Northern Ireland where, where I grew up. Um, in fact, he grew up in the, in the same city and in the same part of the city um, that, that I grew up. And that's kind of um, by the by. But in, in, in 1914, as a boy of really just, just a boy of, of 19 years of age, he was called up uh, to go and serve um, conscripted to go and fight during the First World War. And, and he went and he was transported over to France. He was there for, for a couple of years. And during the Battle of the Somme, which I think either took place in 1915 or 1916, my memory just, it just escapes my memory just right now. But anyway, during the Battle of, of the Somme, he was in a trench um, and, and a sort of a communal area with it within within one of the trenches, and he was sitting there on a on a on a bench, and there was also a group of other men sitting with him, and and round the, the edge of the trench, this communal area of the trench where they were sitting, there was also lots of boxes holding different supplies and munitions, all these different kinds of things. Um, and they, they were they were sitting there. The wars going on all all around them, and, and then suddenly, just almost right beside where they were, there was a massive explosion. A, a mortar shell was fired from from the German side and exploded right beside the the the, the trench where where they were sitting. And, and the force of the blast was so powerful that it knocked a number of the men off their seats, and it also knocked quite a lot of the boxes. Um, there were on the shelves around the edge of the trench onto the ground. Billy McFadgen looked up and he noticed that from one of these boxes, three grenades had rolled out. And he noticed that from one of the grenades, a pin had been dislodged. Now, you probably know as well as I do, as soon as you take a pin out of a grenade, you have just a few seconds before the grenade detonates and explodes and causes mayhem all around it. So he only had a split second to act. And, and what he did in, in those seconds was this. He got up and he threw himself on top of the grenade and it exploded beneath him and he died instantly. But the men who were with him that day they survived. They lived because he died. Because he gave his life, they were able to survive. And I think that's an astonishing thing. That's The world would be a better place if there were more people uh, like that, if, there, if people behaved in that, in that kind of way more. The Bible actually backs that up. The Lord Jesus said, greater love has no man than this than that a man lays down his life for his friends. In human terms, the greatest love that we can display is to give our lives for those that we love. And that's, a, as I say, that's a very commendable thing. That's a very honorable thing. But the love of the Lord Jesus, the love of God towards you goes even further. Romans, Paul writing to the Romans in chapter five, he says this, when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He said it would be an unlikely thing that somebody would die for a righteous person, maybe for a good person. Some would even dare to die, but God 
commands God, demonstrates God, puts on his on display his love toward us in that why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For when we were enemies with God, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And I think the idea behind those verses is this. If you've ever um, been to a, a jewellery shop and, and you want to, to, to buy um, something, particularly if it's made of, of diamonds or, or something like that, what, what the jeweller will often do is before they lift the, the, the ring or, or the necklace or whatever it is out of, out of the box, they will, they will set down a black cloth on, on the desk and then they'll take the ring out and they'll put it, they'll put it on top of, of the black cloth. And, and the, back, the backdrop, the dark backdrop um, that the, back, the black cloth provides, it, it brings out something even, even more beautiful, even more stunning that, that, that can be seen in, in the diamond. The idea in, 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 in Romans chapter five is, is this, the, the way that God has shown his love is against the black backdrop of our sin against that darkness, our rebellion, our hostility, our going away from God against that backdrop. God has sent his son to die for us, that we might be saved, that we might be delivered. And so the love of God is not like human love. Human love goes out towards our, our, our friends, to those who love us in return, but, but divine love goes out to those who are the enemies of God, to those who are opposed to him. But let's think now, we've thought about how love is, is long-suffering. Let's think about how love, love is generous, because what is it that the love of God has actually, has actually um, brought us into? Love, love is generous, love gives. And look at, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we see what the love of God brings us into. It's so that people may not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. The Bible calls us in other places, living, living water, a new, a new birth. It is a hope beyond this world. And this, friends, is, is open to you. It is open to anyone, actually, who is willing to come and put their trust in, in the Lord Jesus. Just to illustrate that, the story from, from the Bible, you can read, read about this in Luke, in Luke chapter 23. The day that the Lord Jesus was crucified, he wasn't crucified alone. He was crucified with two, two other people. They were, they were thieves, um, common criminals, possibly, possibly even murderers. Um, we, we don't know for, for certain all, of, all the list of their crimes, but certainly very wicked men. And they were crucified on either side of the Lord Jesus. Um, and, and initially, they began to, to mock and to ridicule the Lord Jesus. But then one of the other the, the, the other one of these two men had a moment of enlightenment and he began to realize and he actually said to his friends, do you not fear God, seeing that we are under this condemnation? This man, we, we are getting what we deserve for the deeds that we have done. We deserve this crucifixion, but this man has done nothing wrong. He has done nothing amiss. And then he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I can just picture and maybe I'm going to let my imagination get there better better of me here but I just picture picture the scene in in heaven when that man arrived in in heaven and the angel comes to him and 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 he says well you know it's it's great it's great it's great that you're here but I'd maybe just like to ask you a few a few questions could you tell me what what Sunday school you went to and the man so I've never Never been been to Sunday school. Oh, right, right, okay, okay. And um, could you tell me when you were baptized? I, I wasn't. I, I've never been baptized. I don't even know what what that that means. Oh, right. And and you're not a member of a church. Then he said, I'm, I've never never been to church in 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 my in my life. And you can just imagine the the exasperation almost of the angel. And he says to him, Well, he says, Well, then how how are you here? Do you know what I think the answer that that man would give? He would say something like this: The man on the middle cross said I could come. The man on the middle cross said I could come. You know, some of those list of things that I gave you a second or or two ago, I have done all of those things. Uh, I went to Sunday school. I, I got baptized. I'm a member of the local uh, assembly of Christians that meets, meets in, in Gorgie in, in Edinburgh. All of those things are true of me, but none of those things are why I am going to heaven. Do you know why I'm going to heaven? Because the man on the middle cross said, 
I could come. That is all I have. And that is all I need. And you know what the best bit is? You can have that too. He says you can come as well. If you want, if that's if that's what you desire, and we're going to think about that in just in just a second. But if you if you want to, you can be saved. You can have your sins forgiven. You can have your relationship with God restored. Let's just think a, a second or two about what this eternal life, what, what does it actually mean? Um what is it that God gives us? What is this gift that, that he bestows to those who believe on his, on his son? Uh, I, said, I said earlier um, that, uh, that, that it's a hope beyond this world. It's a certainty that whenever life is, is over, all will be well for you. And that is true, but that is only part of it. You see, what the Lord Jesus actually gives you is he gives him, you himself. He gives you something that you will enjoy now, here and now, and for all of eternity. He brings you into a relationship with him that you can never, ever lose. And that's the way you are meant to be. By the way, you are meant to be in relationship with God. If you, uh, if you read in the beginning um, of, the, of the Bible, in the first book, in the first chapter, Genesis chapter one, you will read about God creating a number of, of different things. You'll read about God creating plant life. And when God creates the plant life, he speaks to the earth. He speaks to the ground. He will also, he will also create um, fish aquatic life. And when he creates the aquatic life, he, he speaks to the waters. Why does he do that? Well, he speaks to those two realms because those are the natural habitats. Those are the natural environment for those forms of life. But when it comes to the creation of human beings, God doesn't speak to the earth and he doesn't speak to the sea and he doesn't speak to the air. He speaks to himself. And he says, let us make man in our own image, because in a very real sense, it's a spiritual sense, not a physical sense, but it is no less real than the physical sense. The natural environment, the place that you are meant to live is in relationship with God. And if you take a tree and rip it out of the ground or you take a fish and you lift it out of the water, you might be able to say, I've set the tree free. The fish is free. It's no longer bound by the ground. It's no longer constrained in the water but what's going to happen to those things they're going to die because they're severed from the thing that gave them life now in in our lives it is possible to live in one sense as if we were free from god you can ignore god's offer towards you you don't have to accept the gospel you don't have to obey his his commands but by doing that you are severing yourself from the one thing that can give you life you are meant to live. The natural environment, the place where human beings are meant to abide is in loving relationship with God. Our sin has ruined that, but this eternal life that the Lord Jesus offers restores that. It brings us back into relationship with God. It gives us life, real life, not just existence. That's what most people have on earth. They exist they don't have life, but God offers you real life and life that has to be enjoyed. Maybe just to illustrate illustrate that that point there was a, a video doing the round of doing the rounds on on social media some of you might have have seen this it was the, of the Irish rugby team um, a month or two ago after they had won uh, the Six Nations Championship now and here's a group of men they're sports players um, at the end of last year, they went down to New Zealand and they won a, a test series in New Zealand, the first team to do that in 28 years. Then they came back up here, the Six Nations. They not only won the championship, they, they beat every single team. They won every single match. Here's a group of men and they have achieved the very summit of earthly ambition. They have done everything that they set out to, everything that they dreamed of doing since they were little tiny boys. They have, they've managed to do this. In this video, what what were they they were doing? They were they were on a on a four day drinking spree. And what had actually happened was they'd been out for three days clubbing and partying and drinking. And one of the players had decided that he had had enough, and he went and stayed in his parents' house. And here was a busload of all of these rugby players uh, coming to get this guy to bring him out for another fourth day of, of partying. And of course, everyone thinks this is hilarious. This is brilliant. This is wonderful. It's not hilarious. It's not brilliant. It's not wonderful. It's pathetic because people who drink and party and celebrate in that kind of level of excess, what are they showing? They're showing that their lives are empty. 
Now, the, as I said earlier, these men have achieved the very summit of earthly ambition. They have got everything that they want. And how do they feel? They feel miserable. They are empty. God offers you a relationship with him. He offers you a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is nothing, and I can tell you both from the authority of the word of God and from personal experience, there is nothing like being in right relationship with God. I can go back to my my little flat tonight in Wester Hills, and there's nothing glamorous about that. There's not going to be any uh, championship winners medals around my neck at any stage, but I can lay my head on the pillow and I can know that the son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And let me tell you, there is nothing more liberating, more, more joy filling than, than that wonderful knowledge. One final thing, one final point, and then I'm done. You've listened very patiently, and I appreciate that. The final thing about love is this. Love is obedient. Love does things that you know will make the other person happy, will give, will give them joy. And so let's now bring all of this home a little bit. Let's bring this to, to ourselves. Let me ask you, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Have you ever thanked him for dying for you on the cross? Have you ever asked him to be your savior? Have you ever demonstrated a willingness to let him be the Lord of your life? Because let me be straight with you. This is a binary thing. There's, there's, there's one option or the other. Either you love Jesus or, or you don't. And he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That means that following Jesus is the death of self. And there are so many people in this world, in Scotland, and they are very happy. They would quite like if Jesus would be their savior. They would like to go to heaven, but they don't want him as their Lord. And they don't want to forsake their sin. And they don't want to stop doing the things that they know are wrong, that they enjoy, that take them away from God. They like their sin and they would rather have it than Christ. Let me just let me just tell you honestly and again lovingly this afternoon, there is no heaven without Christ. Heaven is heaven because Christ is there. Heaven is heaven because God is there. And if you don't want Christ down here, if you don't want God down here, you're not going to magically start wanting him up there. And there is no middle ground in relation to this. Either you have accepted Christ, and if you haven't accepted Christ, then you are presently rejecting him. And I hear people, and I had a conversation with a guy just recently, and he said, well, I'm, I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. Let, I, I remember hearing someone putting it like, like this in the past. The devil owns the fence, and he would be very happy for you to keep sitting, sitting there. Either you have accepted the Lord Jesus or you're, as your Savior, or you are presently rejecting him. You're refusing his salvation. You're refusing his rule in your life. So let me just be honest with you and be straight with you as, as I wrap this up. If you're not saved, you maybe wonder, I've heard the gospel before and I'd like to be saved. I'd like to go to heaven, um, but I'm, I'm not, and I'm not sure why. Let me tell you why the reason why that is. It's because you don't want to be. If you really wanted to be saved, if you really wanted to be in heaven, then you would get saved. Then you would come to the Lord Jesus and you would put your trust in him. But up until now, there is something, some reason, and I don't know what that is. Maybe you don't even know what that is, but there's something in your heart and it's causing you to keep God at arm's length. It's causing you to refuse the Lord Jesus. And so my plea to you this afternoon, my prayer for you is that you would be wise, that you would think on the love of the Lord Jesus. You would think of what it cost him, his death on the Calvary, maybe on the cross at Calvary. Maybe I haven't said as much about that uh, as, as I should. He could not have, have done anything more for you. So may you trust in him and may you experience his love both now and forever. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we bow this afternoon in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. We give thanks for this time that we've had together to open the scriptures, to think on, on the love of God. And we give thanks again as we've reflected that there is a God in heaven uh, who loves us, who, who will tell us the truth, who will reveal our, our precarious position uh, at this moment uh, to us, but will also provide a, a way of escape, a, a, a savior, a deliverer, one who has gone to the cross and has triumphed that we might be set free. Our Father, we pray for
for everybody who has listened uh, to this message. We give thanks for those who have taken uh, the time to, to come along to, to the Gospel Hall here. We think of those who are listening online as well. Our Father, our prayer is that they might be blessed as they listen uh, to the message of the gospel. Just take us all now home safely in thy will. We ask these things in the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, thank you uh, very much uh, for, for listening, for your kind attention. It's very much appreciated. And we trust that what you've heard uh, from the word of God today will be a blessing to us all. Thank you.